Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everyone. On this episode, we continue our interview with Mike Myler talking about myths of Akuma trade war. And Mike basically breaks down the entire campaign for us. It's a very detailed conversation. And I learned so much. And I hope you do, too. Enjoy. Trade war is an adventure path for uh, characters at third to twelfth level. So... Are you assuming that like they start as third level characters and they're twelfth level characters by the time you're at the end of the adventure path? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So this so this is a long campaign. Oh yeah, this is gonna take oh golly. If you're if you're playing with uh a group that is that knows their characters and are experienced role players and aren't trying to dilly dally, um Maybe you could finish it inside of nine months to a year. Okay, um, inside a, inside a day, guys. <laughs> <laughs> a really long day. Yeah, I mean, and it, and it depends on how good they are, right? Because like, um, Fangs of Revenge is a mystery, and I had one group that played through it in I think uh, all of uh, maybe two and a half sessions, and the group I have playing through it now is on session four or five. So, you know, it depends on the group, right? If they're really good at solving mysteries, they'll cut through two of these pretty quick. Um, yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, all right, so uh, basically the next nine months of my life are, uh, are, are trying to defeat... Uh, the next nine months of your life are dedicated to Tanuki. Well, okay, so let, let's, let's go over the, the adventures, right? So, okay. um, Scourger of Bishida Temple is the first one. And you're... Oh, Bangoshi, I should talk about Bangoshi. Um, so once the Mists of Akuma show up, right, uh, the government's like, oh, my God, like, we're going to this is going to collapse. So what they do is they pick out uh, special individuals who are able to deputize adventurers. Um, they're called Bengoshi. So they're essentially Johnsons from Shadowrun, but for the government. So they hire up the party and they say, hey, you're going to go do this for me and I'll pay you a bunch of gold. And if you decide not to, I will declare you're a fugitive. So go do it. And the first mm-hmm. thing the PCs are hired to do is to deal with this like temple that's suddenly having a bunch of problems. Like The town of Shibai has traditionally been um, protected from the mists of Akuma. No one's really sure how, but like they've never been, there's never been sightings of the mists of Akuma there, and then the mists of Akuma start showing up. So you go and you find out what's going on, and like the Yurai Fu Wind, or Yurei Fu Wind Chimes, whenever you see one of those like lines over a letter in the names and stuff from Mists of Akuma, you're supposed to hold out the, the consonant or the vowel, and I always forget to do that. Oh, okay. Um, the Yurei Fu wind chimes are gone, and uh, you have to try to recover them. And if you do, you can put it back in the temple and save everybody, and, and it's all, all well and good. And then you hit the first connection. Uh, during that first fight, or first adventure, the, there are these two dudes who are hired by the town to deal with the Mists of Akuba and Adeta Oni, like, overrunning them. They're called the Mubo Brothers. And they're basically okay. two big, fat, stupid, drunk guys with, like, hand, hand-sized cannons, or uh, person-sized mm-hmm. cannons, I should say. Ooh. And um, there's no way to finish the adventure without killing them, basically, because they they take an ire against the party. Because like, how dare these adventurers show up? Who 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 cares who sent you? We're the Mubo brothers. This is our business. So mm-hmm. you have to kill um, Radeningu and Sanda Mubo. And then in connection one, uh, one of the Mubo brothers hears that this party has killed two of his brethren. So he sets up a trap. This one being Q Chi the Wise. So he sets up this like winter valley trap where he like closes down one area. So you have to do a dead run towards him. And he's like up in a sniper's nest with a super long rifle. And mm-hmm. throughout each of the connections, you fight more Mubo brothers. There's a total of six of them. And like every time you you, you think you're good, like suddenly this, this bastard tricks you into a warehouse and lights it on fire. Or um, <laughs> what's the other one? Oh, the other the other guy gets a bunch of pirates together to come come deal with you. And then the last one is just like this super badass and you have a fight with him in the treetops and then he tries to escape on top of a train. That's one part of the connections. And the other thing that keeps showing up in the connections are nature demons. So um, in in Shibai, the thing that kind of gets unleashed by the wind chimes being removed is this wind demon and you have to kill it. And then okay. in the first connection, there's a, uh, a winter spider, you might call it, in Kumo Rui. And you have to destroy that, and you get like some foreshadowing about the Black Tory Gate. And then after that one, there's Shitai Taburu, the corpse eater. Uh, so you have to fight him in the summer. And if you don't get him before he eats too many corpses, bad things happen. And who's after Shitai Taburu? 
Oh yeah, Mad Poor Antan. So there's a. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Getting ahead of myself. So connection A, <laughs> you fight Kuchi and you fight Kumo Rui, um, and then you start to hear about these like farmer peasants getting the superpower armor, and you get some rumors, but you don't actually see one. And then the second adventure is my my blanket. Oh, feud primordial. Uh, so you get wrapped up into this feud between um, two Im- imperial siblings. The imperial siblings are the uh, mythological figures that first created Sobering. Like, all the prefectures belonged at one point to one or another imperial sibling. In Feud Primordial, and I, I, oh, I really don't want to ruin it, um, <laughs> the, one of the imperial siblings is supposed to get something stolen, and you unknowingly are hired to recover it. That's how that rolls out, and you first get to meet the imperial siblings. And one of those imperial siblings is the guy responsible for stealing all this Irigotira armor and, and, and installing it on peasants. Uh, you okay. also get to meet your first peasants in the... Oh, no, it's after, after a few primordial. And that takes you down to, like, the southern prefectures and a river city called Nesudo. And it is, it is another... It's, it's the first mystery that you really get into. Um, I okay. mean, there's a mystery element to the first adventure, but it's not like a... It's more of a dungeon dungeon delving kind of deal for the first adventure, and the second one's more mystery focused. Okay. All right. Uh, so the connection after that one is where you deal with Shidai Taburu, the corpse eater, and um, Tora Sudo, the guy who, who tricks you into the warehouse, he lights on fire, and you uh, first start like interacting. You, you actually get to meet one of the... Um, uh, meet might be a strong word. You get to see some of the, the peasants wearing Ericotira armor and interfere with a fight between them and actual Shikome warriors that want to get their shit back. Okay. Uh, so gotcha. that takes you north into Samon, which is... Uh, oh, I should... Did you see the awesome map for Samon? Yeah. That is same. one of the best things I've ever found in that is public domain. It's wow. Crazy. Right? Do you want to guess what that is? No. I, I, I'm not going to know. I'm not El Paso, know. Texas, circa That's... 1886. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. That it's is so good to mess. Awesome. You get to um Samon and uh there's you're hired to basically break a union because all the railroad because Samon is in uh Hikasuru and they're starting to build this like railroad to try to like better better supply everyone, make a profit, protect from the Mississippi and stuff like that. And the workers are starting to like unite and providing a problem and you're hired to go break the union and you find out um, as you can see by the pictures on the other side of that page, you begin to find out that the the fangs are more than a than just a union. Uh, I, I'm not going to say any more about that one because it's a it's a really good mystery. They're a pottery club. Yes, <laughs> they are a pottery club. That you got it in one. You got it in one. After that one, that's when you go on the the, the water adventure. So you um you take a, a boat all the way around the western coast of Soberin, and there's a way to to speed it up with a really cool creepy sequence. Um, but yeah, you run into this like crazy old man dancing on the water and he tries, ah, I don't want to give too much away. And you have to deal with him. And then also the Mubo brother who gets like, uh, I think three gangs of pirates to try to come after you. Um, then once you get back to the mainland, Cursed Soul of Scorpion Samurai starts. That one is really cool and super insetting. It's about this guy who was, uh, an orphan and he gets taken in by the nobles who run Fu- uh, the, um, Fusan Prefecture. But he falls in love with his stepsister, and then once the like Lord Gaburu Fusan finds out, he's like furious, and he stripped this guy of his title because he was like a really famous samurai, and he uh, disowns his daughter, and then like the two of them try to flee. She gets killed as they're like escaping from the castle, yeah. and then ten years later, everybody who was at the ceremony where um, Hinjuku is stripped of his title and everything just starts to die, like the guy who was taking notes. The servants bringing food and drink, uh, the court, you know, musicians, they all just suddenly start getting killed out of nowhere. So they gather the last three servants who haven't been killed yet, and they put them on an island, and they set this trap for the the scorpion samurai. But um, once the players go to, like, you know, trigger the trap and, like, get them, uh, they find out that they are actually themselves trapped by them. And that's, we're we're slightly more than halfway through. (laughs) Um, It's really involved. It's it's an adventure map. Well, you know what you need? You need to, uh, like, talk to HBO and have them do, like, a Game of Thrones-style, uh, 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 like, series and just do, like, ten episodes for, like, eight years straight in order, in, in order yeah. to explain it. That's what you... That would be amazing. Uh, uh, so let me see. What happens after this Scorpion Samurai? That's the short connection after that one. Yeah, so that, this next one, has a, there's just a really 
quick one because um, the next adventure is called The Ice Sovereign of Storms. And it involves going to an Oni city called Tsukisasu. And the only thing about it is it's on a mountain and you have to do magical shit to get there. So it was really easy to place where the players need to be geographically. So the connection okay. is really short. It's just like, get, just get them to a mountain. Get them anywhere near a mountain. <laughs> and then the adventure starts. But you, the, you, there is an opportunity to find out about the Black Gates during that connection. And you find out that there are two more nature demons uh, that are based on wood and metal. Okay. You don't get to interact with them yet. That, that happens after the ice up. And the Sovereign mm-hmm. Storm is really simple. Um, once you get to the uh, Oni City, you have to um, lay siege to the castle at the top of it and uh, destroy magic circles in time to destroy the like upstart demon that has sort of taken over. And then you need to decide the fate of the city, so you can either put it into the hands of I think, three individuals, and that all has a, a larger effect. Okay. And then finally, you get to uh, fight uh, the last of the Mubo brothers in the, the last connection and um, the, uh, find out a little bit more about the Black Gates and figure out that they're related to the Pale Master. You don't know who the Pale Master is yet at that point. It's Mario and it's Nuki suit. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrifying. Then Revenge of the Pale Master happens, which is a really awesome adventure that I did not write. Somebody else wrote, the guy who got me to D&D. After that, then it's then it's it's on to uh, the Hone no Roy Keep Ascends and, and all the, the going through the, the fortress while the battle's going on and all that stuff. Just a brief stroll through <laughs> through <laughs> through the setting. Just a brief recap of what the heck is going on. Yeah, yeah. just you know, just uh, some stuff. It was like a year some and a half in game and probably at least a year of, of real life gaming uh, once a week. You know what, folks? You're gonna get your money's worth. There's tons of content here. <laughs> There's so much content. And that's and just the first adventure. There's a whole other one that I want to make. What Can you tell me a little bit about what that's hopefully going to be? And definitely. Okay. So um, when I ran the first Kickstarter, there was somebody who gave a uh, mind-boggling amount of money. I don't want to say because it's an embarrassing amount of money. Um, and I was like, okay, hey, are you sure that you want to do this? And you didn't make a typo? And like, I messaged him immediately. I want to make sure, like, hey, because you're not going to just bounce out because that'll, that'll make the Kickstarter not Throw fun because you gave yeah. so much money. Uh, right. And he stuck around. He's just he just really liked the setting. So I've been running this game for him and his friends called the Imperial Matchmaker. He's like, oh, I want this like this thing that has to do with a lot of intrigue and stuff. And um, the premise is that uh, about 400 years ago, there was something called Battle of Broken Spears between uh, the Gekido, the Kirai, the Haikasuru, and um, the what is it, the last one? Namida. And um, it, it's a, it's a pretty big fight, and a, a ton of people get slaughtered. But nobody's willing to admit that they lost, right? And okay. they're still fighting them. Like it's been 400 years, and they're still, still complaining to each other, like, "Oh, I beat the Namita, blah blah blah." So, mm-hmm. um, to like quiet this down and try to unite everybody, Emperor Atoshi just decides that like he's gonna pick out a bunch of them. I think a total of 20 grooms and brides from the different clans and force them to marry, and that will solve this forever. And that's what the Imperial Matchmaker is about. He sets up all these weddings over the course of a month. And it's it's all the the drama and intrigue and, and like abductions and assassination attempts and and, and everything that goes with that, because very few people actually uh, want those marriages to go off. OK, um, although I will say at least two of the couples do genuinely love one another. For the most part, they either want to escape or kill their their betrothed uh, mm-hmm. or otherwise uh, disrupt the marriage. OK, and that all happens inside of San Baoshi. So this. If you want to go and like travel across Soberin, that's what Trade Wars for. And if mm-hmm. you're just like interested in a really engaging adventure, uh, that's what Imperial Matchmaker is about because it all happens in the main capital. There are some side quests that can take you elsewhere, but for the most part, it's all in Sandbashi. So you can just take regular characters and play through Trade War, no problem. Um, sure. If you try to do that with Imperial Matchmaker, it's going to be very difficult because it's built to be uh, a little bit harder and for characters to be a little more powerful. So to that end, there are uh, seven iconics, or no, I'm sorry, eight iconic characters that run the gamut from like, here's an awesome samurai to here's a cool priestess to here's our knockoff of Sun Wukong, the Monkey King, and uh, here's an Eriko Tira warrior and this crazy tengu seer from the future they're all really dope there's a free pdf you can download with with like previews of them and um okay each of them has a special extra thing so like uh kandan the necroji ninja is haunted by these spirits that about 75 percent of the time try to lead him into danger to get him killed or rather destroyed 
but 25% of the time are actually trying to help him. So like you'll occasionally get like a ghostly guy helping you out. Um, Serena gets like whenever she comes into contact with very specific items, she gets divinations about the future. Uh, Tomo, the samurai, her steam arm is a is a Suku Mogami. So like she put it on and got it installed, and then found out it was one of those those things that it has animated, but like now it's like attached to her body. So oh, I love that guy. Oh uh, okay. Then Ryuna. Um, mm. Yeah. And uh, um, so the the iconics are, are are for Imperial Matchmaker because it is it is it is like fifth edition plus it's gonna be extra extra hard if your if your group is looking for something that's if you haven't been challenged if you've been playing through like you know uh, what is it the Lost Minds of Fandelver and then the the Rise of Tiamat and uh, what's the one the Storm King's Thunder um, oh, if yes. you're finding those to be lacking in challenge um, just play through Imperial Matchmaker as written and you'll be you'll be be weeping but um yeah <laughs> so yeah i've already play tested a lot of imperial matchmaker and more than half of it is written and um yeah by the time that that anybody finishes trade war imperial matchmaker should be done so uh i am looking at a picture of matsi tsunamu oh yeah the private uh, eye yeah I, I and i mean i'm guessing that that that's a panda right it's a tanuki it's a tanuki okay it looks very panda-like. I guess, you know, there is a resemblance between them. And with, like, a sword, like a samurai, uh, it's like everything I ever wanted Pandarans to actually be. And <laughs> She has a gambling addiction, and her thing is uh, magic dice. So, like, oh. you can roll the dice, and depending on how it rolls, it might create an illusion that helps you and hinders an enemy, or hinders you and your allies and helps an enemy, or it might not be an illusion at all. Oh yeah. wow! Okay, that's a fun one. That's fun. And all oh. those are illustrated by uh, Claudio Poses, who does work for D and D and the Mainline and Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, and is just uh, unbelievably all, talented. Artist. All over the place. All over the place. All the if if you've heard of it, he's probably worked on it. Pretty yeah, much. yeah, yeah. <laughs> he gets around, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am also seeing a small picture of uh, Imperial Matchmaker or the cover of it. That's a fun cover. <laughs> I really like that. That was He's by so... Renan Moraes, who is another Brazilian artist. It makes me feel like matchmaking is just a really deadly sport. <laughs> and you never want to be in it. <laughs> I'd... Well, I mean, when you're being matched with, you know, assassins and stuff. Right. Well, yeah. well you, but see, when I think of matchmaking, I think of, like, Jane Austen novels. <laughs> and, and this is definitely not a Jane Austen. <laughs> This is this is like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. I don't know how well Jane Austen would actually do as an RPG. I um, think that that would be a tough one. It would be tough to do with D and D Fifth Edition. I could see that working with like a Fudge uh, or a, you know a Fate Fate kind of deal, right? Or maybe right. Uh, Powered by the Apocalypse. Yeah, I mean, if it was more like a story-driven kind of yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, system. Narrative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've had somebody on the show that made a game out of. Uh, basically a an Oscar Wilde play. Yes. So I know that that's a thing you could do. Uh, but if you were actually doing it as like a role playing game, um, yeah, I mean, and anything like that, or the Genesis system or Cipher, maybe. Uh, no, no, we're gonna play it and by the author of uh, Lady Moon Numbers. Or you could just do that and just say it's like it. It's when uh, <laughs> it's when Oscar Wilde just met Jane Austen for five seconds, and they mm -hmm. just made up a whole thing about it. You you were the one that originally came up with the concept for Miss of Akuma, correct? Mm -hmm. yes, okay. Sir. What what was the real driving influence for you uh, coming up with the setting? In Varanthia, we have an Eastern fantasy setting because uh, Varanthia is, itself is like six settings contained into one world, which is a whole other podcast. But um, <laughs> so I, I, I had a lot to do around with Eastern fantasy, but um, something about it just wasn't wasn't clicking for me, and I, I really love like victories that are are pyrrhic right like the right. heroes won but their mom dies or something you know just like you, you win but you don't win like i feel those are sure. are more memorable and and valuable role-playing experiences that stick with you longer um right. so i wanted to make a setting that that was reflective of that but like that's just like inappropriate from urethiel because urethiel is about wuxia and wuxia does not include that right? i see except for maybe the middle arc but that's 
another conversation. So, right. um, yeah, yeah, that's 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 why. And then once once I got the setting out, the writing the adventures was the one the cursed soul of the scorpion samurai, right? Yeah. That was from writing stuff down in the outline to sending in the file to the printer was like one week because it just poured right the fuck out of me because it's just <laughs> trapped in there. So I don't know. I, I think it really appeals to the darker, more disturbed parts of my psyche, which are pretty prevalent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. Like, the ones I keep writing all these books. future employers or anything, but like, yeah, yeah, it's real easy for me to write for Mr. Fukuma. Like, like, real easy. Maybe that's not something you bring up like on first impression. I've got Depends these on the job I'm interviewing for, you know. That's true. That's this true. is why I would be the best person for teaching your kindergarten class. Is not the kind of. Dude. <laughs> no, that's right. I feel like I want to watch this job interview now. Uh, now, in terms of the artwork, uh, you were the primary artist. Uh, no, no, no. I don't. I, I can't art. I can do graphic okay. art, and I make all the maps. Okay, I... so the layout and graphic art. That's what I'm thinking of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do okay. all the layout and graphic art. Yes, yes, yes. And I, like I said, I pull a lot from Okiyui, so. Um, Anyone who is familiar, like Kinoyoshi and uh, Kino Hagai, show up a lot. Um, and then I hired out Claudio Poses when I'm able to. So he does the Iconics, and he did the cover for Mr. Vakuma. And then on the interior, I used uh, Indy Martin, who is amazing. Uh, Jacob Blackman, who's also great. Uh, Nathaniel Bachelor and Sarah Shijo. Um, Oh, wow. And then I hired up Renan to do the cover for Imperial Matchmaker, and I'll probably get him for another thing. And then I'm hiring... Um, a new girl uh, named Hope something or another to provide some accents to go throughout Imperial Matchmaker. Okay. And then uh, some of the things like you were showing me the map, those were all public domain pieces? Uh, the sim- same one was a public domain piece. All the other maps are stuff that I make. Oh, okay. Excellent. Yeah. Now, Samon is still just blowing my mind. Uh, I know, right? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't. I found that, and I was like, no fucking way. This has to be copyrighted. And I looked <laughs> everywhere, and it was not. And I was like, yes! I feel like at that point it would be public records, yeah. And there's another isometric map in there too. There's two. There's one that covers uh like the Tezuki Railhouse. That that's from Japan. That was that was not from El Paso. Oh wow. Right? Like that's ah, very nice. It's ridiculous. No, some of these are beautifully done. It it feels like they had to have like the modern airbrushing technology that we have for doing technical design in order to make these well, you figure all the advances that came with the Gutenberg printing press over um, 300 years, mm-hmm. th- that same amount of effort and 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 evolution and refinement happened, but for a different kind of printing press that just wasn't good at, at changing type. So they'd make oh, okay. like one plate, and that's why it was typically images, because like, you know, you can't just change the words around. Right, right, absolutely. And the picture is worth a thousand words. That's what they tell me. Yeah, they, that's what they the say. The levels of in- intricacy and stuff in Ukiyo is just, just, oh, just phenomenal. <laughs> and I, yeah. I've made a whole product line around it. It's really good. You know? Yeah. There you go. Must be good. There exists things that you can buy about it. Mm-hmm. And everyone's seen the Kuragawa wave, you know? Yeah, I did see that. It looks like there's a little dude surfing on it, too. That's Matt Perrantan. Yeah, Nathan, get with it. I'm sorry. I don't know every character. I, <laughs> But he looks like he's having fun. Oh, and the map and all that of the boats after that, the boat map was actually by Rick Hershey. That's one that I, I bought stock rights for. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't make the boat. Yeah, I don't fault you for that. It looks no. like a hard. It looks like a hard boat to make. I mean, I looked at it, I was like, oh, I could spend $4 buying the stock rights for this, or I can spend, like, three hours making my own boat. It's just... <laughs> it just doesn't seem to add up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. And if you go two pages past that, there's a carp. Like, a carp man, which is a Kiyoi. Yes. Like, oh, it's koi. ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Like yeah, our our traditions suck ass compared to Japan. <laughs> like we got that's because we came. We got that's because our traditions are all English. We got Hieronymus Bosch, and that's like it. <laughs> that's it. It just like ends there, and then we go to Japan. Like here's a carp guy. Here's some tanuki with like house size balls. 
Here's a giant. <laughs> like it's it's insane how how much more awesome Japanese artwork is. We want to talk a little bit about the actual uh, Kickstarter? Well, right now I am waiting for um, the print proof of Trade War to come in because I want to be able to show off. Like, hey, look, I have the book. It's it's here. It's ready. Uh, it's already like one of these books is already done. So people who pledge to the Kickstarter will get their their stuff uh, within I think two weeks of um the uh, the Kickstarter ending because I had to wait for Amazon to like confirm payments and all that all that kind of jazz. I tried to make it cheap and available to people. So like the lowest level pledges is for fifteen dollars, and that will get you um either uh, fifteen dollars for Imperial Matchmaker PDF or eighteen dollars for PDF of Trade War, which is okay. I think an awesome deal. Yeah, um, it's a great deal. for for nine to twelve months of my life. That's not bad. <laughs> I try to I try to make it worthwhile for everybody. And and there's a primer for Soberin. So like to introduce your players to it, there's a quick I think like 40 pages that gives like a basic rundown and like some snippets. Like here's the rules for a samurai. Um, and when we designed, I knew for a fact like they're definitely going to release some kind of official samurai for D and D five e. But it's mm-hmm. almost certainly going to be a fighter. So yeah. our samurai is a paladin, and oh, okay. our Wu Gen is a warlock. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, so like you should be able to use that in com- with uh, all the stuff that you'll find in Mr. Vukuma should be easily compatible with the existing Eastern fantasy options presented by Wizard of Coast. When you say Wujin, all I can think is the uh, Weeaboo Book of Fight Magic or whatever it was. Oh, no, no, Wujin are like um, they're manipulators of of arcane nature magic, and uh, specifically in Mr. Vukuma, there are people who have made deals with the entities that have have consumed the seasons right Mm -hmm. so there there isn't a winter anymore there's a thing that ate winter and that's what's making stuff cold in the winter or when you know when it should be cold and that's who you ally yourself with if you're wujin and and like you can choose to like okay why i'm i'm all about uh fuyu no yaban and so that's my patron or you can just have the sea the seasons be your patron so when when fall changes the winter your patron changes so a little more exciting for for warlocks so i feel Kind of get shafted on player options a little bit. Mm-hmm. Whew, yeah. So and in, in the trade war itself, uh, stats wise, there's 50 maps in the book and <laughs> over 100 NPCs and monsters. So even if you're like, I don't know how much of this adventure I'm going to use, uh, it's a it's a map and monster book for for ages. Yeah, it's a huge reference guide, regardless of whether you use a, the adventure path or not. Right. Right. And. Uh, Trade War and, and Imperial Matchmaker are good for Shadow of the Demon Lord, but only um, the Iconics are only built for 5th edition because the Shadow of the Demon Lord version of Imperial Matchmaker will be built like uh, regular Shadow of the Demon Lord adventures. Because the scale for Shadow of the Demon Lord is entirely different. It's only levels 1 to 10, and, and there are many other different considerations involved with translating it. Yeah, okay. Uh, the cover for Imperial Matchmaker guests, as I'm looking at it, uh, oh, okay. makes me think that this is uh, this is not uh, the kind of wedding party I wanted to go to. Uh, that's the <laughs> opening sequence in Imperial Matchmaker. Um, and that's oh. the, one of Sarah Shijo's illustrations, which she just, like, crushed. Yeah. So, uh, it opens with, like, you're, you, you and your buddies are invited to, like, a tea ceremony in the Emperor's estate, which is, you know, huge. Like, that's huge. You're mm-hmm. not nobles or anything, so, like, being invited to the Emperor's house is crazy. And then you get there, and they're all like, hey, um, you, you tried to poison this person. And that's unacceptable. Just cuts his freaking head off and then declares that anybody caught interfering with the Imperial Matchmaker proceedings uh, will be executed. And then, of course, you know, the players get drawn into interfering. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and so you never know. You might, you might get your head removed from your body at any time. After Perfect. That. Well, it's got, you got you to gotta instill the fear, you know? Mm-hmm. You make, it, make it feel dangerous. Well, that would definitely be a like a, a warning sign to me. I would I would definitely be on my best behavior after that. And now uh forty five or more, that's when you get uh, both adventures. You get the Yes, uh, yes. And I don't okay. I don't send print books. I did that once. I took I took orders basically in advance for, for hard copies for Hypercore twenty ninety nine and then I decided to add some pages and they upped the printing cost on me, so I ate like almost a thousand dollars that I did not plan for. So okay. What I do is I give out vouchers. Mm. So you get okay. a voucher, and then you just pay for the paper, ink, the glue, and the shipping. So um, I think oh. it's like $18 uh, plus $5 shipping. So 
Oh, well, okay. Excellent. And then it doesn't like constrain me on page counts and things like that. It lets the book be as good as it can possibly be. Oh, okay. Excellent. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, let's see, a $70 level is the, I, I want all of it. Yep. Okay. And you'll be, you'll be inundated with Mr. Vakuma for at least two and a half years. Perfect. Excellent. And you'll never need to play another RPG again. That's a pretty good deal. <laughs> that, that, that's a pretty good deal. And um, I, I got a bunch of people ready to do stretch cool stuff, which is going to be, I'm going to compile them into like a book of additional side quests and monsters and magic items and stuff that you could use with either one of the books. Excellent. Yeah, I was going to ask about stretch goals. That, that's all about getting more assets together. Yes. Um, okay. There's a couple of really good ideas in there. The one that I like the best is actually the, the most rote. Uh, somebody was basically just sent me a pitch that was a very short summary of the Seven Samurai. And I was like, okay, man, well... <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna take this, but like, how much experience do you have? Do you realize this is gonna take more than three thousand words, and like, it's gonna take me more than one map to to make this work? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah right. I guess. <laughs> um, I'm stoked about that one because I love Japanese cinema, and and The Seven Samurai is such an amazing story. And like, everybody's gonna be like, oh, The Seven Samurai, yeah, yeah, we're The Seven Samurai now, yeah, definitely. Now, does that have like kind of a Kurosawa vibe to it? Kurosawa vibe, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, that was kind of one of the reasons I asked the guy. I was like, you realize how much research you're going to have to do. You're going to have to watch this movie at least three times. The four-hour movie. Like, I hope you're ready to spend two days watching this movie. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready for that. I, I haven't seen Seven Samurai. It's four hours long. Wow. It's worth it. It's worth it. I'm sure it is. And, it's all subtitled, right? Uh, yeah, it's all subtitled. I wouldn't watch a dub of it, honestly. Um, yeah. Mo- most of the time, I'm okay with dubs, but that's don't, don't watch a dub of the Seven Samurai. Part of the reason it's four hours is because the pacing is not... Uh, what you're going to be used to, but it's yeah. worth it. it's, it's worth watching. I've seen Magnificent Seven, mm, which, yeah, Magnificent which is, Seven is based on it. Yeah, yeah, it's basically the westernized version of it. So, uh, and uh, when does that actually launch? Uh, this should be launching in the beginning of September. Um, okay. Like I said, I'm waiting on that print proof, and the print proof shipped from New Jersey to Ohio, which is unbelievably frustrating for me because I'm right in the middle of New Jersey and Ohio. Um, shipped this morning so it should be here any day we might launch before september but with the stuff going on right now on kickstarter i think i'll probably just wait for september. okay yeah so when people hear this it's going to be right around the corner mm-hmm. uh, and i'll so. um i'll give you guys a link so you can give people uh one of the free pdfs and inside the pdf there will be links that you can click to check out a preview of the kickstarter page and 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 then you know save it and pledge when it goes live beautiful excellent Perfect. There's so much goodness for you to enjoy. All the nice things. Make sure to check out the site, and we'll have a link for that, too. Man, I've, it feels like I've gotten a crash course in this episode on so many things. Uh, hell. <laughs> yes, I've gotten a crash course on Buddhist hells. I've learned all that. <laughs> That's very good. Vagaries um, of Japanese artistry and uh, printing yes. processes are following the Mindy Restoration. Yep, yep, yep. Yes. Yep, my... All of the wonderful things you were hoping for in this episode. Tanuki! Yes. The truth of Tanuki! <laughs> oh. The terrifying truth! <laughs> yeah, you know what? Uh, what Nintendo folks, doesn't want you to know. I'll let our listeners just uh, research that in more detail on their own time. I don't, I don't need to tell you anything more about Tanuki. Is there anything else that we're uh, forgetting to talk about, Mike? If, if you're tired of steampunk, don't let that dissuade you from Mr. Wakuma, because I have kept you in mind this whole time. Beautiful. I mean, I do like steampunk, but I don't need it all the time. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same way. So there you go, folks. If you like steampunk, but you don't always need steampunk, you have an option now. (laughs) And if you just want to torture your players that really like steampunk and punish them for it, like, this is the perfect place. (laughs) This is a perfect resource for that, too. And if you like steampunk, that's great. You're about to get all the steampunk. And also, there's a giant flaming rooster. And so and as you're firing so, at it, suddenly your gun sprouts eyes and bites your hand. <laughs> oh, my God. All oh, right. I forgot to talk about the items. Oh, my God. Yeah, oh. no, keep going. Keep going. It's, no, 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 no. Now I need to know about items. What about the items? I, I just heard about something that could eat my hand. So, so every adventure, like I said, I really like to give the players enough rope to hang themselves. So pretty perfect. much every adventure has at least one intelligent magic item that the players are going to want to keep, even though it's really bad for them. OK. <laughs> um, the one is like you, you get a bunch. I think you can just force disadvantage on two attacks coming at you per round, but uh, you 
constantly gain Haitoku. Oh, and Haito Haitoku and Dignity. Um, so the Mystic Akuma operate on two attributes that are added to the game. One of them is Dignity. It's how good people think of you, right? So sort of like honor, but based on perception. Okay. And then uh, Haitoku, which is like the literal translation is fall from virtue. Just think of it as the dark side. And as you go higher up in Haitoku, you get bonuses. Like you move faster. You can ignore damage at a certain point. But when you reach 23, you're transformed into a dead one. Um, which are the, the zombie things. So okay. one uh, of the items, just you gain a high toku every single day. So if you don't get rid of it, you're going to change into a monster. Um, and you have to try to build a cult while you have it. Okay. The other ones are like intelligent katanas. Uh, my favorite, I think, is the the Umbrella Sukumogami, because it follows you around and it aggrandizes whoever's like wielding it, even though secretly it hates them and is trying to get them killed. If you're a this team that likes to fuck with your players, like, yeah. Well, you found your game. <laughs> this is a dangerous, dangerous world. You don't even have to work that hard at destroying your players and everything that they believe. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations, your players are dead to you. <laughs> but you know what? Some people like that. Dead players? I love dead players. Well, the dead Bart. The pile of dead Bart. Well, my problem is that whenever I run a game, I, I don't like to... I hate when people railroad me, so I, I just leave it super open-ended. It's like Grand Theft Auto. You can just do whatever the hell you want. So right. that's how I keep end up making these campaign settings. I'm like, oh, it'd be cool for an Eastern Fantasy game. And yeah. like now here I am with like thousand pages of Eastern Fantasy game stuff. Right. Well, no, yeah, what you have now is you have like a, a world that's like open world so you don't get railroaded. But like every direction I go in, horrible that's things right. befall me. <laughs> That's right. And then I can just throw my hands up there. And it's the world. It's not me. No, I didn't do anything. Exactly. <laughs> I'm just world? following the text. It's right there. I didn't. Hey, what do you want? Right. We tried. Alex, uh, have you learned anything on the show today? So, so much. A lot of which I'm going to need to have a lot of brain bleach for. Bra yeah. Yeah. There are some things that you will never forget. Uh, your eyes cannot unsee. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mike Myler for being on the show. Mike. Thank you for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. It was fun. If uh, anybody is out there and wants to learn more about Miss of Akuma or Trade Wars, uh, where could they go on the internet? Uh, go to MikeMyler.com, and there's a button at the top that's for campaign settings, and you'll find all my campaign settings, and all of which have like four or five free PDFs. And what more, I challenge anyone who plays D&D 5th Edition or Pathfinder to go to my website and not find something you like. Challenge? accepted yeah, afro samurai i got venger i got professor moriarty i got 20 posts about playing warhammer 40k and D, D 5e i got a star wars hack i got Ooh. the streets i have a fucked up modern sesame street hack for D, &D 5e i swear <laughs> to god Beautiful. you will find something you like on my website oh very nice See, the second you said warhammer in uh, in D, D, i figured alex's head would explode for real this time Oh, you, no. oh, you didn't know about the hack yet? Oh my god, I keep I found out that there are two separate independent gaming groups in the Seattle Microsoft offices playing my hack. They apparently really? found out about it while talking at the water cooler, yeah. I was like, no <laughs> fucking nice. way, what? You people make more money than I will see in my life. What is going on? <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and uh, so, Alex, I might ask uh, if anyone was interested in finding out more about Delve, where could they go? You can find more information about Delve over at Delvecast.com. And uh, when you go over to Delvecast.com, uh, you can find all of our episodes and all the other things that we do. Because, boy, it feels like we do a whole lot. Uh, and uh, when you uh, happen to be over there, maybe check out our little uh, Patreon button. It uh, is in the corner. And uh, you can go there and find uh, all of the things that we offer to our patrons. You might find out a whole lot about Tanuki. If you are a patron <laughs> for this, uh, and of course, I want to thank our shiny level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dom Perry. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining. And boy, I hope that the extra conversation in this episode made it worthwhile for you. In addition, you can find us on uh, Twitter. I am at Citanium. I'm at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. Mike, uh, can they find you on social media? Yes, I'm at Mike Myler too. And now that I think about it, uh, starting tomorrow on the 17th of August, uh, the at Midgardia RPG people are doing actual plays of Miss Fukuma game. Oh, beautiful. Okay. How long is that uh, running for? 
Oh, golly, I don't know how fast they play. Uh, it could oh go for quite a while. Okay, so chances are when people hear this... The first game should be up by then. Yeah, yeah, you'll be able to uh, listen to it. And uh, as always, make sure that if you happen to be on any kind of podcast app, the uh, the iTunes or the Google Play, you please rate and review and subscribe. I like getting stars in any single form that you can give them to me. And uh, so, if uh, if you get trapped in the midst of Akuma, and uh, you end up with a giant uh, flaming rooster bearing down on you. Uh, I think the best thing you can do is uh, stop, drop, uh, roll, and then hope that you don't get your eyes pecked out. That's the best advice I have. Yeah, I guess that's good advice. I would hug yeah. that flaming rooster and just embrace my weird, awkward end. <laughs> you know what it does make for a great story this <laughs> is appropriate <laughs> at least at least your obituary is going to be fascinating to read yeah, nobody <laughs> just, wants to get that no one, and at least you're going out doing what you love man comes to foul end the pun <laughs> with this rule no be groans forever <laughs> spicy chicken wing You've never, you haven't seen a spicy chicken wing until you see the one that killed somebody. <laughs> That's a good one. Spicy chicken wings kill man. Spicy Foul chicken. flaming death. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's as much as we can talk about roosters today. And uh, so again, just want to thank Mike for, for coming on and explaining everything about Miss of Akuma, a trade war about multiple levels of hell of creatures I hope never to encounter in real life. So, so thanks, Mike, for fueling my nightmares for years to come. <laughs> You're most welcome. Yes. Uh, and uh, for everyone here at Delve, well, basically me and Alex, uh, thank you for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye. Bye. Uh, I, I, I have no idea. I think we went over quite a lot, and uh, my brain is just uh, fried now. Your brain is fried because there was so much Tanuki you didn't expect. <laughs> I, there was way more Tanuki than I ever wanted That's, to Tanuki. That is, <laughs> that is absolutely fine. So the episode title is going to be Tanuki, Tanuki Nuki Panic? No. <laughs> no. That's pretty good. <laughs> no.